How's everyone doing today? Good. How about you? Yeah, good, good. Kind of towards the end of the conference, right? Mm -hmm. To catch the sessions you wanted to catch? Yeah. yeah there's a lot to get into. Yeah. How many of you are new to open source? Do you feel like it's a different language? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so that's what the panel is all about, is uh, how do you learn the language of open source and inner source uh, as you are you know, coming into this arena? Um, the acronyms, the culture, the, the collaboration, the community, there's so many new things to learn. And what we want to do as a panel is each of us will share our stories of how we came into open source and how we learned the language of open source and inner source. And then we'll go into what are some of the, the better communication strategies we've seen, uh, how should we improve the communications and collaboration in open source and inner source, and, uh, and then really welcome your questions. Um, it's, it's important for you to walk away feeling um, I, I can navigate this world you know, more effectively, and I have some tools in my box, and I'm inspired by people's journeys of how they got into open source and inner source. So this is an incredibly uh, diverse and amazing panel, and we will go around and introduce ourselves. But first, let me introduce myself and tell you the story of my journey into open source and inner source and how I learned the language of inner source and open source. So um, it was back in 1998. Uh, I was working at Silicon Graphics, which was a server company in uh, Mountain View, California. And we were a very proprietary company. And open source was just beginning. You know, Linux was just kind of getting started. And uh, the company decided to embark on an open source strategy and moving some of our products to open source, so shipping Linux-based servers, if you will. And it was such a foreign world to me uh, in terms of uh, I had to learn terms like a community, um, a project versus product. Um, how do you work with community? Uh, and you know, how do you uh, kind of bridge enterprise customers who expect you know, um, guaranteed service with communities who kind of do their best effort? And who'll do what they can, so so it was it was a lot of le new learning for me, and and it was also a, a kind of a new time in the industry when all of us were learning together. So my guide was uh, a maintainer, uh, and some of you may know him. Jeremy Allison um, was my guide. He was an open source maintainer of the project Samba, and so he helped me kind of understand how open source projects work what is a maintainer versus a committer versus a contributor versus a user, and how should companies uh, work with open source without kind of coming across to corporate. So there's all of those nuances that, that I had to learn. And then along the way, I then you know, open sourced a project at another company and started a community there, so I learned a lot about how to manage a community and then went on to product manage an open source project uh, product at another company and so learned how to work product versus project and how do you bridge the two um, and now run an OSPO uh, at Amazon and open source program offices, frankly, all of us are culture guides and we are guides to developers working inside the company to communities outside the company. So with that, I'm going to turn to Claire and ask Claire what her journey was into inner source and open source. Thank you, Nitya. Nitya. And uh, I'd start by saying that my, um, that for, relatively speaking, I'm a, quite a newbie to the whole open source world. So I spent most of my career uh, working with developer communities, but in proprietary software. Um, and it wasn't until about 2017, 2018, that I first uh, started working with an organization that was commercially linked to open source. Before that, I kind of thought it was all 
you know, unicorns and rainbows and passion projects mm -hmm, and people mm -hmm. in their bedrooms. And it wasn't, I, I didn't realize that people were actively using it as part of their um, commercial uh, business operations. Um, and when I did realize that, and saw that uh, it not only was a fantastic way to develop software, but it explored these areas of collaboration and really it was all about how people work together better. Um, I became fascinated about it. And more particularly and interestingly, I, I was actually looking at it from inner sources perspective. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who are not familiar, that's the use of open source practices, but behind organization firewalls. So, it's to, so often to create proprietary software, but using open source methods. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I became involved in a community called Inner Source Commons, um, and that is interestingly a community for inner source practitioners, mm -hmm. but run as an open source project. So all the the materials that Inner Source Commons has are all available on GitHub, and we all contribute to those materials using open source methods and practices. It is mm -hmm. open source. Um, so that was a sneaky that was a sneaky way to get me doing open source. So now now, now I have a, you know a GitHub um, you know ID and I was you know looking at my little green boxes and I too had guides. Um, I think that's an interesting yes. uh, parallel. Um, my journey started because I met Denise Cooper in the organization I was working with, who was the founder of Inner Source Commons and, of course, a long-term mm -hmm. open source advocate. She was a great guide for understanding a lot about the, the kind of culture, the principles. Um, and then I had also guides at Inner Source Commons in particular. Um, folks, uh, there's folks here in the room, so I'm going to wave it all ye. Um, but in particular, uh, there was a there's a chap called Johannes, who's one of mm -hmm. our um, uh, board members and members. And uh, uh, I remember Johannes, like, Step, stepping me through the process of my first commit um, and uh, or my first pull request and then my first commit and I remember the excitement like I, I literally afterwards I was tweeting like or, or not tweeting I was texting uh, Denise and I was like that, that was so amazing that was such an amazing I'm not like I've got a high from that and she's like yeah like uh, and I was like why don't more people know about this because it's such like it's an amazing process and um, and she's like it's not all unicorns and rainbows Claire and I was like okay 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 but at the same time I'm firm believer that the open source community has a huge potential to bring this process to a broad range of people mm -hmm. that's far beyond developers in a, in a way to bring collaborative working methods to a much wider audience. And um, like it is when it works well, it is so good that I just feel that the world needs yes. to more, more people in the world need to know how to do it and not just technical folk. Um, so this conversation for me, um, I feel very particularly about this bridging, creating a common language between technical people who self-identify as being technical and people who self-identify or being a bit scared about that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that that's an interesting uh, topic we might explore. So thank you. Exactly. Jan. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Chan Vong. Um, if Claire is a newbie, I'm a new, 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 new newbie. <laughs> um, uh, my experience with open source has always been in an academic setting up until recently. So my first interaction with open source um, was at university um, learning open data. Um, and so as a student uh, learning about data, I had to quickly get large amounts of it um, free and available um, and then be able to open it, uh, analyze that in open tools. So, you know, students don't have money. <laughs> so you really we really had to, you know, be able to search and um, utilize what's out there for us. Um, I had a lot of guides and mentors along the way and eventually um, moved on to a master's degree in spatial analytics where I got to learn um, a lot about the OpenGIS community. Um, and then I moved on to uh, program manage a data science team at a, at a university in Colorado uh, where we focus mainly on research, um, both interoperability and reprodu reproducibility. Um, and that really relies on open source software. Um, you know, in order to get good research out there, you have to be able to um, uh, have it available for all people um, in the research community. Um, and then just earlier this year, I joined the Comcast Open Source Program Office as a program manager working with developers on contributing to open source. Um, and I've met a ton of you already, um, so thank you for coming out. And I've really, at this conference and through a lot of our Zoom um, 
discussions. I've learned a ton from all of you here in the open source community, and I hope to keep that going and then be able to spread that knowledge to others as well. Anna. Hi. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Ana Jimenez. And I got into open source, I would say, thanks to my uh, former uh, company I work for. Uh, five years ago, uh, I was working at a company called Viterja. So uh, Viterja was kind of a special, it, it was formed uh, in the, um, within a, a university, an open source center uh, established there, uh, formed by researchers and, and professors, and they, they started that company focused on uh, software development analytics, and they were my mentors. I mean, um, I, I would say like they did, and they are doing great job mentoring and uh, helping uh, their employees uh, to get into open source, to understand open source, and to love this community. Because thanks to them, is uh, I know everything I know now. Um, and uh, and then moved to uh, right now I'm the OSPO program manager at Tutor Group that is a Linux Foundation project focused on um, OSPO adoption helping we are a group of OSPO practitioners and organizations having an OSPO that are uh, helping in resources, common tooling, uh, research and, and more resources. Uh, to to help them others advance in their in their open source program office journey, and, and yeah, and, and that is and I think also thanks to open source I found my way in this world like why why I'm in here, um, so so yeah I will say that is my short story. Vicky, hello everyone. My name is um, Vicky Timili, and I'm was a coder by trade, but now I'm happily coder as a as a hobby, because I'm mainly uh, involved a lot with the Irish tech community here, um, especially advocating diversity in tech. So my first foray into the community was in mid-2005, so I've been around the block quite a bit uh, with the Python community, so I ran the Python Ireland meetups for quite a while because people said, hey, we need to find somewhere and have a talk with slides instead of huddled around a small table in a pub, and it was quite noisy. So when I said, let's do it, and then I go, no one did it, so I just went and just did it for them and then after 10 years they're like okay this is enough someone else can take it over you've grown every, the community's grown quite a bit during that period um i chaired for PyCon ireland as well and during that and also i kind of um founded a few different initiatives like a launch pi ladies dublin which i still run um uh, got um um joined uh, women code dublin i was one of the directors here um, member of the Women in Technology and Science Ireland. I'm involved with a lot of stuff, and of course, uh, one of the main co-founders of Coding Grace, where pre-COVID we ran kind of um, diversity friendly and inclusive uh, tech workshops for those who are interested in technology or upskilling and uh, are terrified of going to tech workshops and events. So we want to create a safe environment where the mentors and facilitators or people from the industry and we're all volunteers. Um, since then, I've been curating um, news, events, opportunities for uh, specifically focused in on the island of Ireland, so Ireland and Northern Ireland, um, because um, there's a lot of information elsewhere, but here in Ireland it's always fragmented, and specifically pulling information di uh, for diversity in tech um, community here. And uh, out of curiosity, also uh, cur curated, curating a list, or have curated a list of diversity in tech groups around the island of Ireland. You'd be surprised, there's over 70 groups, so it mm. is for a small island like this, and for not much, not a huge population compared to other large countries, um, it is still needed. So I'm coming from that perspective where I, um, as I didn't, uh, from a previous talk, you got community caretakers, so I am one of the caretakers. So um, I was calling myself an organizer. But thank you for the opportunity for inviting me here in this panel, and thanks to Claire, that's how I met everyone here in the panel. And if anyone needs to talk to me about the Irish tech scene here, come talk to me at doors are always open. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that's common here is um, not all of us are coders, not all of us are techies, um, and it, it really illustrates the importance of so many other roles in open source and inner source. Um, the caretaker role, you know, someone who kind of organizes things and gets people together and shares information and aggregates and collects information. 
uh, the person who guides the company from an open source program office perspective, someone who gets companies together to share their knowledge and you know building new practices inside companies. It, it's it's the it's the lifeblood of open source and inner source. You cannot do uh, without these connective tissues and these people who communicate and create these organizations. So I just wanted to highlight you don't have to be a coder to be an open source and inner source. You can bring your superpowers and skills to the table and, and help with you know whatever you have to offer. So with that said, um, one of the things I noticed was communication was quite different in you know open source and inner source compared to in companies, right? We often do emails and meetings and PowerPoints and things of that nature. So tell us about your communication style with an open and inner source and how do you kind of navigate, uh, what tools do you use? How, how do you make sure you're heard? Thank you, because it was a big change from, from my perspective. I mean, I think there there are, there's maybe three kind of elements that I think we've talked about before, but it's, it's some of it is the language itself, mm -hmm. right? You have to know mm -hmm. what the acronyms mean. People talk about processes like you should understand what a PR like process is yeah. about, and you're Just like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're like, oh, what does that mean? And yeah. then you have to set yourself up technically to do that. Um, there is... There's also the, the tools that they used. Mm -hmm. So that was my mm -hmm. first introduction, things like Slack and um, you know asynchronous messaging and the, or just even in terms of how people document their uh, pull requests and the fact that it is asynchronous just as a method of how you communicate. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I think there's 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 loads to learn like that that is actually new if you're coming from a traditional corporate environment where yes. email, where it is predominantly by email or through physical huddles, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, but the thing that surprised me most actually has been, um, well, first of all, my, uh, we were talking about this earlier, but um, my, my usual way of getting to with the language and the acronyms and things like that is to lurk a bit. So I just, I just go in and lurk a little mm -hmm. bit in all the mm -hmm. communities and see, see how people phrase things. I like to think of a pretty good mimic. So then mm -hmm. I, try, I try mimicking how people are phrasing. I'm like, does that sound weird? Like, you know, does it, <laughs> will people respond to me if I say this? Um, so that's a bit about the language. But what really surprised me was that kind of um, different ways of communicating. So things like the asynchronous messaging or even just like documenting the whys behind yes. why you're asking something. Yes. All of that sort of thing was totally new to me. Like it's just not, the, it's, it's not the context that's given mm -hmm. in like business kind of, like in my previous roles. And it's so useful. Like it's so useful for, for a newbie now coming in to look at other people's mm -hmm. conversations. And it's so useful for me to even remember why the hell I asked that question in the first place. Like, right. a, like two months later, I'm like, why, the, why was I talking about that then? <laughs> and now I can actually remember because I can go back and look at the documentation. Um, so I guess there's, there's, the, there's the methods, there's the language, and there's the tools. And I have found all of them to be an incredibly uh, valuable mm -hmm. experience in expanding my ways of communicating. Um, and I'll, I'll just, just one small story, just sorry if you but if, if just around the asynchronous communication. Um, I think uh, the, the fact that that has helped me is one thing. I've heard many stories about how it helps other people um, with accessibility issues, mm -hmm. with the fact that they may not be as comfortable in in-person meetings or real-time meetings. Mm -hmm. So there's many other benefits to these varieties of ways of communicating that are present in the open source world that are perhaps not present in other um, kind of corporate environments. So I just want to kind of call that out. It's hugely powerful in so many ways as it being a clarifying tool and a tool to increase accessibility. Absolutely. Um, you know, so. And especially in the last two, three years when all of us have been working virtually and remotely, uh, some of these tools and techniques used in open source, async, et cetera, have really been useful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I'll note actually, and again, loving being here, don't get me wrong, this being meeting people in person for the first time in a couple of years has been incredible. But I would not have made this journey without the fact of the pandemic opening up so many events to be virtual, yes. because I would never have had the budget to go to any of these that's events right. before as part of the community. So I'll just put a nod out, keep, keep some events virtual, please, because yes. that, that's a great accessibility. Yeah, and, and on this topic of accessibility and language, and so I work with a lot of um, non-English speakers, um, and so when you're virtual, um, it's 
and when and then when you're in person you have your mask on it's hard to read the lips of someone or hard to really hear um, when English might not be your native language for me Chinese is my first language Cantonese specifically is my first language and so then um, he, then I have to shift my brain to the English and then to the technical aspect and then to and then every other little thing that is involved in that and so um, it, you know I think that if we can open up the accessibility channels for that it would be great um, for me I think my advice for communication styles is I have a program management background and so my advice would be to um, think about what your communication style is what your stakeholders communication styles are and then write that down uh, for program managers we call it a communications matrix it's actually like a well systematic way to do it and there's a lot of research out there um, on how on how to do that um, for me personally I, um, I have a sentinel kind of personality where I really rely on data, practical information, tested practices, and I, I really value also supportive and collaborative environments, which is great for an open source community. Um, so while you know I, I, I use my Sentinel personality to my advantage in working with um, legal, technical, security stakeholders, because I think of well, they really like data and facts, and so do I, and so if I communicate my data and facts to them, um, then I can understand more about what they care about and then take that information to create a clear, easy to understand, and empathetic message to our developers um, who are looking to, to contribute and really helping to guide that kind of translation. Um, I think it's important, but you, can, you, you really have to have kind of an understanding of what your stakeholders want and how they, and how they speak. I think you bring up an important point, which is that in open source, you're often working with lots of different kinds of people. Uh, at one time, legal, uh, the community, and maybe business, and developers, and uh, maybe data and factual information helps you kind of reach all of them. But also, you're acting as a translator across all of those folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, actually, I wanted to highlight that um, I think uh, a best practice can be uh, build more hybrids. So a uh, short story about myself, I, my bachelor's degree was marketing. <laughs> and I translated, I transitioning a lot because I get into coding, I started to develop some website because for fun. And then I got into data science. In fact, I uh, finished my master's degree in data science two years ago. All of them, um, I remember all my colleagues were engineering and I was the crazy marketer person there. Uh, and yeah, it was hard, but I just got the chance to uh, play with the data, to struggle with the scripts in Python, to learn different programming languages. And now what I have is I got knowledge from uh, data science and from I understand more the developers at least and I also understand the marketers so uh, I can speak the language of both sides and if we build more hybrids mm -hmm. in this ecosystem mm -hmm. that will be great because they will be the able to facilitate this conversation and I also wanted, now that you were mentioning about um, accessibility issues, uh, in my community, one of the things uh, when dealing with uh, non-English uh, native speakers, I'm also non-native English speaker. I come from Spain, and so it's Spanish, my first language. Um, one of the examples uh, we do to improve this accessibility is on virtual calls. Uh, we, we use Zoom, and Zoom has live captioning. Nice. So this way, uh, it helps uh, mostly non-native English speakers to really uh, get the message and, and read when people are asking. Uh, it's not like listening to it. They can also read the answer, the question, and take the time to answer in advance. Okay, uh, from my side of things, from all the various events and workshops that I've been running, I think it's a great opportunity, especially for those now, mind you, the facilitators and mentors that come to our work technical workshops, they're not lecturers, they're not trained profession, professional teachers, so they have a lot to learn from their side, especially as their first time facilitating a workshop. So when they start talking tech, they just start doing a tech workshop, you'll go into a flow and 
suddenly there is like acronyms and tech terms coming out and a lot of people who might not understand the tech might get confused so I also make sure that we have enough uh, facilitators around and coaches to help people in case they fall behind and it's never it's there's no such thing as a, a stupid question it's like that's what this space is for put up your hand ask those questions because at the end of the day that kind of is a feedback for everyone saying oh okay I might need to rethink the way how I explain what I'm doing, what I'm teaching, and it'll help them, especially presenting to like, you know, uh, conferences or presenting to a company kind of hand, all hands or whatever it is. So it's kind of educa educating for everyone, so not for the learners, but also, feed but not feed uh, also feedback for the people facilitating uh, and also speaking, presenting. Um, one other thing is um, I noticed that um, some folks who come to the workshop, they're not particularly there to learn about coding, they're actually more or less like, I'm a project manager, I'm not a coder, but I really want to find out what my team is talking about because sometimes I, you know, not that they were, you know, being pushed aside and saying, oh, they don't understand what we're talking about and they don't, and they're afraid to put up their hand to ask the question. So it kind of helps everyone and helps improve the project and help improve the community all around. So um, so that's kind of my, my input on that. You know, um one of the things I find myself doing also, if, if I'm talking inside the company, I use a different uh, terminology and voice because you do want to be heard by your business stakeholders and uh, those who provide budgets. Uh, and they want to know what the value and benefits are to the company. And then there's a different voice when you talk to the community. And, and because you can't use unicorns and kumbaya inside the company, uh, so you just have to really moderate who your stakeholder is and how you uh, communicate uh, all of this. But you, you all brought up many good practices in communications. Are there other things we can do to improve communications and inclusivity and accessibility in open source? What else can we do? Um, I suppose I'll Please. Can, very quickly, I will probably say you mentioned a lot of different um, communication tools. And a lot of people are still terrified of even going saying, oh, Slack, everyone's using it. But no, not everyone uses Slack. Discord is like everyone is using it. Yes, but not everyone is um, want to go and use Discord, you know. Oh, but there's text, there's like uh, there's like Slack, and there's video, and there's, you can share, just like Zoom. But, and then using that, and like, oh, it's just, so it's kind of, um, I think onboarding, if you're like, um, have a community and you have several different communication tools or different ways of speaking, I think if you, especially yourself, you have to also basically take time and think about how how you communicate with people, and also if you have volunteers, make sure that you kind of in, in not onboarding new ones, but also go around and tell everyone saying, okay, we're using this tool, making sure that everyone's still comfortable with it. Is there any feedback that people just don't like the way how how we're communicating? Is it not accessible? Um, as you mentioned, um, mentioned that you know people might like to have this live conversation. Like I've been to you know conferences where they tried this live questioning thing. Mm -hmm. It was terrifying. You know, people don't want their face up in a big screen in front of hundreds <laughs> of people. Uh, it's okay. That is okay. But then that's their voice left out, and you don't want to lose mm -hmm. those voices as well because they are the community. Um, so that's kind of um, what I, I, um, I suppose onboarding and revisit tools are out there. We have so many different things out there, open yeah. source tools, so much stuff out there, property and open source, but. You know, we just have to be conscious of what we use and not just say, this is what we're using, that's it. Yeah. Uh, so. I love the onboarding piece. So by the time people need to use those tools, they're comfortable with it. And, and each community is different, isn't it? I mean, and they all have their own different ways, yeah. And uh, I would say that based on my own experience, because that worked for me, I would say the power of mentorship. Like having these mentors on an individual level, like maybe having these advocates mm -hmm. or uh, developer relation experts uh, that um, mentors uh, in open source uh, for non-tech people to tech people, both, both sides. And also on the organizational level, I will say that um, open source program offices, for instance, can be a vehicle to enhance this mentorship and nurture uh, the organization of open source understanding. So uh, the same way I was in the in our organization um, be um, mentored into open source, I think more organizations can also um, take those learnings and 
and uh, nurture their employees into, into open source best practices? I think Anna just stole my answer. <laughs> no, <I'm good>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate that idea of um, using OSPOs as a vehicle um, and going going to your OSPOs if they exist mm -hmm. or creating OSPOs within your company to um, have a group of people who can support you. Um, for me, I think that um, for us to improve communication styles, um, we really need to be open to all of the tooling that's out there and not just one way. I think that we have to lower the barriers to entry mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to, in order to provide that inclusiveness. There are people who are who want to be part of this space who, who may not even know about this space and um, I think can can thrive in it. Um, again, I, I'm fairly new to it as a OSPO professional, um, and when I found it, I thought, perfect. It's it's perfect for um, what I want to do in my career, and so I think there's plenty of people out there who, who would feel the same way, um, but it's um, being able to uh, lower our barriers to entry um, and, and mentor um, people and being willing to provide the time to mentor them. Yeah. I think you brought up one example of lowering the barrier to entry, virtual events. Yep. Um, I think Angela, who runs uh, the Linux Foundation events, says that there's such a huge spike in people attending um, during the COVID days, you know, I, I call it uh, before COVID, after COVID, during COVID. So um, I think from Africa and from Asia and from so many different areas of the globe, um, I, I agree. We should continue making that happen. Yeah, I mean, it, it was. It, I mean, it was a factor in me being able to follow this as a career. Yes. I, I, and I honestly think I would never have been able to make that happen otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, just from an accessibility, being able to find the connections you make. <clears throat> so, I, I always think that the the you know people. People sometimes say that you can't make these virtual connections, mm -hmm. but I, I know, I've met people here today that I've been working, I'm looking at you guys, I've been working with for two odd years and never met in person. And I can honestly say we came here as friends. You know, like there is, there is, a, there is a, you don't have to meet people in the real world to have a trusted relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that that is a, another element that really helps um, communication and uh, the ability to, start to communicate effectively mm -hmm. in an area you're unsure about. Um, but I will also say, so, so I, my, my tip would be around this idea of informal, um, uh, I suppose, systems around the formal communications, because I'm totally on with everyone, things where people were saying mm -hmm. around multiple ways to communicate, supporting different styles. I love the idea of thinking deliberately about that because sometimes it's kind of a bit ad hoc. It's kind of like, ah, oh, we have a bit of slack and we have a bit of events mm -hmm. and we have, mm -hmm. but the idea of actually you know, thinking formally to say, are we giving different options to people and are we being consistent about that? I love that. Um, but I'll also say that some of communication is about trust and feeling like you're in a safe space. Like personally for me, some of the things we tried in Intersource Commons was um, creating fake hallway tracks before our community calls, whereby we all come on 15 minutes beforehand, anyone who wants to, if you're just mm -hmm. hanging around and we talk about what's been happening in your day and let's introduce you to my cat and, you know, how, how, how is the weather in your part of the world? And it's this kind of informal chatter that can then make people feel like they have a, a way to approach people to say, I had no idea what he was talking about. Can you, you know, can you help me here? Like, or, or why did they say it in that way? And, and th those kinds of questions are harder to ask if you haven't had a bit of chatter and laugh with people. So I'll, I'll add that to how it can be a really important factor. Um, uh, and, and it can be done virtually. It's really good to do it in person, by the way. So I, I like I, <laughs> I think we, you know, we, we've had some great experiences here that you couldn't replicate online. Um, but there are great ways to do it virtually too. I, I, I also, you know, one of the things you can do in in a live setting is having a meal together, right? And and you bond over uh, having a meal together. But and the inner source commons, you actually made that happen. Uh, every one of us had to bake a cake. Yeah, in a <laughs> that's right. I and couldn't eat my one. Eat it was our like cake together, <laughs> and uh, that was kind of lovely. Uh, but I love your idea of um, you know breaking the ice in the beginning of 
you know, a session, joining early and kind of getting to know everybody, and even having a back channel to somebody you trust in, in the group and say, am I hearing that right? How should I express myself here? And uh, so I know we have about six minutes left. So I, instead of asking the next question, I'm going to throw it to the audience and, and see if there are any questions from the audience on communication, culture, collaboration. How did we make that better? How did we kind of get started? Uh, you talked a little bit about, oh, um, oh sure. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, I know I talked a little bit about lowering barriers and having lots of different communications channels. Uh, at my company, uh, that has happened kind of sporadically. And so what we're finding is that we have uh, fragmentation of communication channels, meaning that we have groups that, that should be talking to each other spread across multiple channels, and we don't have any way to put them back together again. And I wonder if... Uh, if you have any advice on that topic, I guess is what I'm asking. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I'm going to say in, in the community I'm right now, uh, that it's, that I've heard that <laughs> before. Uh, so, and the answer is um, there is so many diversity that people are going to be more comfortable in one. Uh, some people are going to be more comfortable in one uh, channel and the others in other and you're not going to never get like the this um, a, a one uh, channel that fits for everyone uh, but if you uh, I, what, I, what worked for me was to try to get a list of all the different uh, channels that are there and which ones are the more inclusive ones like for instance in our community I know different channels are not accessible for certain uh, community members because uh, they work at industry that they have for instance Slack is not available mm -hmm. so offer as a second option, a channel that can be available and is more inclusive. So uh, even though you might not have all the uh, people coming to that channel, at least it's inclusive so people can get into that. So given a few options, not just having this is one, the, the channel we're going to use and maybe there's people that are not comfortable doing that. And also maybe documented um, in several ways like how to get onboarded into those tooling because that is important. You, even though you know how to use Slack, maybe there's people that come there for the first time or Discord or what all the different channels we were talking about. So this documentation, written documentation and also offer um, possibilities uh, where people can engage. Fully agree with all that. Um, and to add in, again, back to this idea of deliberate approaches as well, which, which you've described, but um, uh, one of the things that we found often useful is to have people who know it's their the role or they're really good at actually translating from one channel to the other. So you have folks who are going along looking for discussions that relate to patterns and kind of going, that's a pattern. Can you potentially put that over in the patterns group and then guiding them through that process? And so this idea of actually having people deliberately look for translation points and formally recording what those ideal paths are. So you wouldn't do that for everything. You don't need to you don't need to tran you know, translate my conversation about my dog into GitHub because you know, it's not relevant. But when we do have a conversation that might be recorded, you know, what are those triggers to say, let's make that more formal? That would be a really interesting one to share in our Slack. That's a really interesting one to put in the newsletter. And, and people are constantly then alert for that and, and signaling that that might be a, something that, again, someone that's not technical might be a really great role for them to actually and onboard into the community um, by helping in that way, because that's a, a different skill set. Yeah. And, and the only other thing I would add is if you're making an announcement, make it in all the channels, yes. right? Because yeah. uh, your, your point is really good. Um, people all have preferences in terms of which channels they use and how they can use it. And so we have to accommodate uh, multiple channels, sadly. But yeah. those checklists are getting yeah. very long. So we've yes. actually created a checklist for announcements now so you don't forget because people That's do. Right. They're always like, oh, I forgot that one. I forgot to put it yes. over in LinkedIn, you know? Exactly, and like... exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Super. Thanks for this great discussion. I was lear learning a lot. Um, so I have a question. In your roles in the OSPO centers of communication, um, what do you find is the key difference in communicating with women developers versus men developers, specifically from different cultures? So, so Rupa runs um, a fantastic retention of women in tech organization called ThriveWise. So I can see why she'd be interested in that question. Yeah, thanks uh, so much, Ashley. I think, Bikki, you're, you're doing a lot in this area. Um, so uh, how to rephrase that question again? Um, really inclusive. How do we... So I suppose... Um, in my early days of um, trying to, so I've been mean, general Python Ireland meetups at the time. I just went to it. I was young. I was like, oh my god, someone's into Python. Oh my god, get to talk about stuff. I just didn't re notice the people around me. And, and um, eventually, after a while, I go uh, I see one person just like myself. I was like, oh my god, you're here for the meetup, and then they're gone again. So and then when I start running them, um, and I start asking these questions, especially around the conferences, I said. How do I get more people like myself or other people who are, um, you know, more diverse community to come to these events? So I went to an event um, called um, the Ireland Girl Geek Dinners, and I asked the organizer, can I specifically ask, have a conversation on why there aren't enough, you know, people like myself going to these conferences, especially PyCon Ireland, because I was trying to get people to go. Um, it was my, I, I was just determined. And a lot of them came back was just the messaging. The messaging. So that was this was years ago. It was like two thousand and nine or something. But at the when when I was looking into it, it was just, and it's still the same. Sometimes in uh, in, in some I events, you still see the messaging is still geared to oh, I'm not technical enough. I'm not in the specific area, so I shouldn't be going to it. Even though I'm very curious about it, or should I be there? Um, because some of them are like a lot of them are paid conferences and events and things like that. So I think um, to make make it more um, inclusive. Um, Definitely is um, the messaging, the wording, um, um, description, um, and 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 um, especially those who and also don't forget the people who are organising the committee, um, being able to see who's there. You don't have to say you're a diverse inclusive. You just you just see it, yeah. and then people start talking. Um, and that's I think from my perspective about kind of if, how to make it a more inclusive and more accessible for people, um, especially in a very you know I, I, I think intentionality is what's so important right and uh, when we were when I was at Comcast and we, we specifically looked for women speakers and we specifically uh, wanted to make sure that uh, women developers in the organization felt welcome and they didn't feel like this was just aimed at you know the uh, the, the men in the room and and I think it really requires intentionality, kind of looking at your invites, uh, having a diverse community of, uh, for the conference organization, and then reaching out and making mm -hmm. sure people are there and feeling welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that's the end of our time, sadly. There's actually one um, question. It's on the chat. I just want to add on. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, so can can we take problem. another two, yeah. three minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's lunch time, so. Thank you. Okay. So. Um, Lunch can wait. <laughs> so the question is, well, it says, really great conversations. What are your thoughts of communities having sort of like a terminology doc to explain acronyms in open source terms? I, I think that's a fantastic idea. Uh, you know, it, it, communities kind of uh, document coding styles, how to contribute, readmes, etc. So having a doc that says, here are the common terminologies we use. Here are the uh, communication tools we use as a company, as a, an or, uh, as a project, or even as a company or a project. Uh, I think that's a great idea. I want to add one of my favorite ones. I think we should also have an emoji library in things because I'm like, <laughs> like I find the emojis are yes. like for a given community. I mean, I have a whole array of dancing penguins for various <laughs> different feelings that I want to convey, and I think it would be a good one as well. That's a good one. And I would say, um, Claire in the Inner Source Commons has your uh, 
people in the InterSource community have created a common vocabulary yes. um, in your repos, and then in the to-do group as well have created standards and um, really bringing together this common definitions. Yes. Um, so there are people doing it, and there are resources out there, so be on the lookout for that. And to answer uh, Drupa's, Drupa's question, again, I'm going to do a plug, but there's a um, talk later today around 5 p.m. Um, Sona Type is going to be giving the talk on Remember how I would love data? They're going to be putting data into um, kind of the gender gap in open source. Um, so be on the lookout for that conversation. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Chan. Thank you, Claire. I really appreciate all of your perspectives. Thank you, Nithya. Have a Thank great you. day. Thank you.